Good morning again. Morning, morning. Before I even preach, I want to lift up our local. Well, uh, they were a local family. They moved down south. Um, if you're not, you know, familiar, haven't heard. Chris and Melissa Racky's son um, had an accident at the pool yesterday and, and drowned. Um, they weren't there. He was with friends and um, school group. Um, he was sent to the hospital. Talked to her this morning. Things he had a good night, but still a long road ahead. Seven years old has a, a twin sister, um, so all all four of them need our prayers. So I want to do that before anything. I know George opened up with a prayer, but can't pray enough. Um, as I told Melissa this morning, I woke up several times last night, and that was all I could think about was was them and that little boy. You know, they were access pointers when they lived here. Um, you know, good good friends for many years, good part of this community. Uh, he was a local firefighter, so they were a big part of Edenton, still a big part of many of Edentonians' lives. Um, but we want to lift them up. So let's go to the Lord in prayer for, for Aiden. God, we we come to you. God, just without the words to know what to say to Chris and Melissa, as parents having to endure such a situation, getting that visit from a deputy telling them that their son just drowned, that he's en route to the hospital, just nerve-wracking through every second of, of this ordeal. So, God, we lift up Chris and Melissa, lift up Aiden and Riley. God, we pray that you give peace in this horrible, horrible situation. We pray for healing. We pray for recovery. And we pray that, that Aiden can regain health, regain strength, and get back to the young boy that he is. So, God, give them that hope, that assurance, that peace, and even that joy that only you can give in these unspeakable moments. And God, I pray that this draws the community closer, that this draws Chris and Melissa closer to you, and the four of them closer together as a family because they're leaning into you, God. Thank you for the friendships. Thank you for this community here reaching down south to Surf City and Surf City and their new friends surrounding them with, with love in this time. So God, help us not cease with praying for them, continually remembering that you're still a, a God who performs miracles. You're still a healing God. You're an all-powerful creator. You are a sovereign Lord. And God, I pray that they lean into you more than ever before in this time. Thank you for all that you are and all that you do. We love you, God, and we thank you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Continue to be with them. Continue to pray for little Aiden and Chris and Melissa. Um, it's hard to move into the sermon with that, but I didn't want to start without a prayer for them. But moving into the sermon, we have been in this heavy series a long, a long time. Um, in fact, I had I had the main screen up, but I think I, I clicked the, the button. But with with the heavy series, again, we've answered a lot of your typical questions, some that maybe you've heard, some that you've asked yourself about faith, about scripture, about God, and all with the intent to answer all of these through what is God's word have to say well one of the most popular ones today it goes along with you know you christians are bigots you christians are racist you christians are misogynistic you know we get the whole gamut you don't just get one nowadays it's you're all or nothing it's, it's all encompassing in that that accusation of of bigotry and yes one of the bigger ones is 
misogyny, that the Bible and that God is misogynistic. You know, they, this world, this culture we live in, they'll, they'll pick a verse out, read that one verse, and then say, look, your God, your Old Testament God, especially Richard Dawkins, one, he just flat out says the Old Testament God is misogynistic. And many follow in that bandwagon, believing that claim without ever actually studying even more, without trying to answer the question or gain a, a, an understanding of context of that verse that they cherry picked out without reading any other bit of scripture. They'll read that because, well, that fits the opinion that I'm supposed to have. That's the worldview. That's what I'm told we believe. And therefore, I'm going to jump on to this accusation of misogyny within Christian circles, within Scripture. Their very Bible is misogynistic. So we as believers need to be to answer for ourselves. But also when these accusations come of bigotry or misogyny, are thrown at us, we need to be to say beyond just, no, that's not true, but back it up with Scripture and say, this is what God's Word actually says. And so I want to look at that question. Is the Bible misogynistic? Because by isolating certain passages, we do have critics who claim that misogyny is approved in Scripture. And then again, that even God is misogynistic. But when we're willing to dig a little deeper, we realize that these claims are contradicted both by Scripture and history. And often what we see, typically those seeking to expose misogyny in the Bible, looking at certain passages, they also use that same misguided approach as those individuals who also very wrongly look to justify misogyny by using the Bible. So both ends of the spectrum, those who claim they're Christians but are also misogynistic, will take that same verse that critics of Scripture use. And so neither one are right trying to justify their either their opinion or justify their action. So you get it from misogynists who claim to be Christian using misguided approaches towards Scripture as these critics do who again cherry pick a verse out of context and say look God is misogynistic here's the verse here's the reference without any other context tearing that one verse because it fits their modern cultural conventions instead of taking into account ancient cultures instead of taking in the historical relevant context neglecting the overall message they say this one verse is misogynistic therefore god is misogynistic scripture is misogynistic and all of you christians are misogynistic but again if they're willing to actually listen or read or study a little bit more they understand that in order to claim misogyny in the bible what you have to do it is absolutely necessary it is very wrong but what they have to do is separate those passages they're claiming, they're quoting, and remove it from the entirety of all of Scripture. And again, worst of all, they ignore the profoundly positive effect that biblical Christianity has had for women worldwide. So the only way to claim misogyny with God or in Scripture is to take that one verse completely out of Scripture Therefore, it fits my modern convention, my modern opinion, this cultural worldview today that all Christians are misogynistic. That is the only way to do it is to remove it from the entirety of the Bible. They have to ignore the whole of Scripture for them to make their point, which you begin to see that that's not how you read any passage of Scripture. Scripture interprets Scripture and if there's a supposed contradiction, then you have to be willing to dig a little bit deeper to understand if it's God's word, it's not contradictory. It is without error. And therefore, what is a clearer understanding of what this passage is actually telling you? So by reading scripture, as we'll see today, by understanding context, we see that no, God is not misogynistic. Yes, we see where the Bible contains references to women that 
in our modern minds, they do sound discriminatory. But we have to remember that when the Bible describes an action, it does not necessarily mean that the Bible endorses or condones that action or behavior. The same with many sins, all sins. You can't say, well, the scripture talks about this guy murdering another people, therefore the Bible endorses murder. No, no one's going to argue that, but we will with the topic of misogyny. You know, we see all throughout Scripture men treating many people in evil manners. We see men treating women as nothing more than property. But that doesn't mean that God approves of that action. It is highlighting, as it often does, the very worst of humanity. The Scriptures do not shy away from the worst of human behavior. And so the description of misogyny does not mean that it is condoned in Scripture. They are simply laying out the worst of humanity. And often when we see the worst in humanity, those very acts, including acts of misogyny, are condemned in Scripture. But, again, those critics, they'll leave that part out. And, again, just want you to highlight the first half of the verse because it fits their opinion instead of being willing to dig a little bit deeper, have a clear understanding of what that verse, what that passage is actually saying. One example is the rape and murder of the concubine in Judges 19, 25 through 29. That is a horrible, horrible retelling and an account of an actual historical event. It's, it was an act so appalling that it did spark a civil war because of how gruesome, how vile, how disgusting that act was of this individual just handing his concubine over to be raped and murdered by these individuals. Scripture, again, highlights the very worst of humanity, but then following it condemns the very worst of humanity. You know, the critics of the Bible eagerly point to such incidents in Scripture, but they don't mention that the act in question or the act described is denounced. It's not encouraged. It's not endorsed, but rather condemned because of its vile, evil nature. But again, if you want to make a point fit your opinion without context, again, you can easily twist it very incorrectly to fit your preconceived notion because you are prideful in wanting to change that said opinion. Because if we take all of Scripture as a whole, we see Scripture teaches many beautiful, positive things about women. One example is where we were last week in Mother's Day with Proverbs 31, a beautiful passage of the strength, the leadership, the courage, the love, the kindness of this virtuous woman, this image of what it means to live out godly wisdom as a wife and as a mother. It is a beautiful endorsement and encouragement for both men and women. So when these accusations of misogyny are, are laid out, all we have to understand as believers is it is based solely, completely, one out of pride because it fits what I want my opinion to be, and then it's truly a lack of knowledge of Scripture because if they are willing to dig deeper, willing to get a fuller context, they'll realize that their opinion has no foundation, has no grounding. You know, it's this inability or just an impulse to disregard Scripture in order to fit that preconceived cultural opinion because the world says that's supposed to be my opinion. Christians are misogynistic. Bible is misogynistic. Christians are bigots. Well, that's what this side is saying. Therefore, I want to fit in. I agree with it. And therefore, I'm going to ignore anything that counters my preconceived notion and opinion. But again, if we're going to say that Christianity is misogynistic because there are certain verses that can be interpreted in a negative sense through an incorrect reading of Scripture, just because, again, it's described in Scripture. If we say, well, it's described, therefore it's endorsed, then 
the also the same argument is well you have to say that christianity is not misogynistic with that same mindset because there are many verses that are positive about women so you can't pick and choose which is it because all of scripture does highlight the worst but it also elevates the beauty of women and their roles all throughout israel all throughout human history all throughout the early church so again it is a an invalid argument to say that because it's present the bible obviously endorses it but as believers again to them they say well that's not enough let me find another verse cherry pick to to fit my opinion and so with so many accusations we need to be to answer that question is the bible misogynistic is the bible sexist well the first thing again we have to do is look at the cultural social differences between 21st century america and the ancient near east ancient israel the old testament times during this time virtually every culture in the known world was very patriarchal in structure and nature it's very clear that even outside of scripture when we read extra biblical accounts of history that many of the rules that governed all of these societies was very patriarchal women in many cultures were deemed as nothing more than property and if you couldn't produce a son then you were valued even less scripture mentions that but again it doesn't mean scripture endorses that but with our modern eyes, with our cultural norms, with our refined 21st century opinions and knowledge, right? We say, well, their standards are sexist. Those people were misogynistic. But just because we claim to be more refined as a culture doesn't mean that we can judge with such critical eyes on how an ancient culture lived or how ancient Israel lived. But instead, we need to read Scripture through the lens of that historical context to the original audience instead of appropriating our American standards onto them. Say, their government doesn't line up with our government. Their cultures don't line up with our cultures. Instead of appropriating what we see today, we say, how was the world in the Old Testament, in the ancient Near East, in Israel in the time of the law and in the Old Testament narratives. You know, what was life like for people both inside of Israel and outside of Israel? And if you compare the two, especially with laws like Hammurabi's Code, you realize that there were a lot more freedoms and a lot more glorification and praise towards women than any other culture at the time. But because it doesn't match American refined culture, we say, they're misogynistic you know again we have to look at it through the lens of historical context but even considering the historical context they still tend to judge the bible judge god of sexism and misogyny remember first again it was a different time and the bible once again did not shy away even from the worst aspects of society so we have to remember that acknowledgement does not equate approval. And cultural norms and social structures of Israel do not mean, do not imply that it was God ordained. We saw in many cases when Israel got away from God's standard, got away from what God ordained. And that included the social and patriarchal structure found throughout Israel and the surrounding ancient near east because god did ordain the original order in society but like everything else we touch as mankind we've corrupted this order israel corrupted that order and even in our refined american culture we've corrupted the family order the family structure the gender structure that was created by god and when we corrupted what god ordained from the very beginning that is when inequality came into the picture that's when misogyny sexism racism all of the things that we title bigotry today it came because we've twisted distorted and got away from the order in which god himself designed from the beginning of creation 
It's that exclusion, that discrimination that if we're willing to admit it's the result of the fall of man, the result of the introduction of sin. And so when sin became of the, a part of human nature, when sin came into this world, with that sin came inequality. With that sin became a twisting and distortion of God's original design for the order of humanity. Because when men and women have taken their God-ordained places and lived according to God's design, then there is, and we find, a wonderful balance between the genders. A balance where we say, yes, we're different, but God values us the same. Yes, we have different gifts, different skill sets. We have a different look on this life and even different responsibilities, and that is okay because it works together as God designs, and we see a marriage flourish when we're willing to say, I can't do what my wife does, but thank God he put her in my life. Instead of trying to take over or trying to let her take over what my role should be because I'm lazy, I now see that it works in balance because it is as God ordained as God created for humanity. You know, that balance is what God began with. It's our sinfulness that causes us to be proud, to be selfish, and to lead to the unfair treatment of others. It is what we then say, because it's not my gift or not my role, I'm prideful, I'm jealous, because I can do it as good as you, and therefore I should do it. I'll take over your role. And then that leads to laziness for the other half, or either just trying to include or become a part of that other gender that other group because again all of it begun begun with you know twisting the very design that god from the beginning created the beautiful union the blending of man and woman both equal both valued yet both different in a beautiful way that works together but this world again wants to distort what god designed from the beginning and so sexism, misogyny are a result of sin. The truth of the Bible gives us the cure, gives us the answer, and that is the cross. Because the cross of Christ is the great equalizer. In John 3.16, it says, whosoever believes. There's a fully inclusive statement there. Who is saved? Whosoever believes. The cross of Christ was sufficient for the sin of the entire world. It becomes, as we call, efficient, effective in our lives because of grace and faith at work. And so who comes to that saving faith? Whosoever believes in Jesus Christ, whosoever comes to him, it's not dependent on race or gender or social status or even mental capacity. Whosoever believes. We see that the cross is that great equalizer of equality. We also see in Paul's words in Galatians that speak of our equality with salvation. This is a beautiful verse. Galatians 3, 26 through 28. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Again, there's no misogyny at the cross. There's no misogyny or sexism endorsed or condoned by our Savior, by our Creator. In the very beginning, the Bible gives us that beautiful picture of what mankind should have been. The structure that God set up and the value of both. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. Didn't say God created man alone in his own image. Created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. There is equality in value, equality in salvation, equality in need for a Savior. From the very beginning, God created both man and woman in his image. There is no hierarchy in that value. There is equality of worth and value in men and women. That right there by itself debunks any claim of a misogynistic God. If God was misogynistic, it would have said, man, I created in my image. Women, I created in the image of man. 
No, both male and female created in the image of God Almighty. And then the beautiful picture of salvation where it's offered for all people regardless of race or gender or social status. And that is salvation through Jesus Christ alone. We see many references, but specifically John 14, 6, Acts 4, 12. There's no other name under heaven or earth which people are saved except that of Jesus Christ. In the matter of salvation, there is true gender equality. There is true value with men and women. But yet, people love to cherry pick. And cherry picking verses, these critics argue that, well, you may say that salvation is for our all regardless, but really, the Bible doesn't teach gender equality, but rather it condones sexist or misogynistic pr- practices. And some of them know verses to, to pull out. And yes, several Old Testament passages regarding the treatment of women are disconcerting to our modern ears. But again, as with every passage we read, we must be willing to dig a little bit deeper to understand that full picture, that full context. And so I want to look at some of the verses used as ammunition, as an argument for a misogynistic God. And yes, to our modern ears, it sounds, man, this is quite harsh. But again, The Bible does not shy away from the very worst of mankind, very worst of humanity. And these laws that were given through Moses by God were meant to protect his people. So let's look at a couple examples, as they want to call it, of misogyny. Deuteronomy 22, 28 and 29 says, If a man meets a virgin who is not betrothed and seizes her and lies with her, And they are found, then the man who lay with her shall give to the father of the young woman fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he has violated her. He may not divorce her all his days. And then that same general rule in our command in Exodus 22, if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. Okay, so again, in our modern ears, we're like, man, that's, that's extreme. That seems very harsh. It's rough to our modern senses. And they use it as an argument to say, look, these verses say that a woman, a virgin who is raped, has to then marry her attacker. But that's not what these verses are saying. The reality of these verses is a lot more, I say a bit more, but a lot more complex. Because a very important note, these verses are talking about consensual sex, not rape. There are verses that talk about rape, and we'll get to in a second. Because people who claim that the Bible teaches that victims must marry their rapists conveniently ignore the preceding verses. Because... The next verses, those verses also found in the law, clearly address rape. And then say that rapist is now going to be under the death penalty. That act is akin to murder. It has carries carries the same penalty. A rapist is now forfeiting his own life. But that's not what this verse, these commands we read. We say, well, this man lives. This man is is able to keep going. He has to pay, but he doesn't pay with his life. And the reason being is because these verses are not talking about rape. There are verses that discuss rape, and again, the penalty is the death penalty for that attacker. And for those in instances of rape, it says, do nothing to the young woman because she did nothing wrong. And so, again, rape is, is compared to murder. God took sexual assault far more seriously than our Western courts do today. Again, with the death penalty when it was proven to be a guilty rapist. But these laws that we just read stipulate that a man who had sex with a young virgin, a unbetrothed virgin, what he's done is essentially negated her opportunity for marriage to anyone else in Israelite culture. And so he must pay the appropriate bride price or marry her. 
he was not permitted to ever divorce her despite any other legal allowances for divorce in the law. He could not divorce this wife because he, again, negated all of her opportunities for marriage because he took her virginity, something that was very serious in Israelite culture. But look here also, the woman was not forced to marry the man. Her father could refuse, and the man would pay the bride price either way. And yes, this may seem very odd to us, because we don't see sexual relationships with the severity of Israelite culture. If we did, then we wouldn't see how pornography is so invasive in our communities. It's so in our faces, in the eyes of our young people, such a horrid addiction and such a rich um, industry as a whole because we don't view sex as we should. We don't have that lens through God's holiness and the sanctity of marriage in our culture. And so to us, we're like, well, so what? They had consensual sex. It's not that big big of a deal. But it was, and it still is, because we are destroying again the very design that God gave to mankind in relationships and in marriage as a whole. So again, as odd as we may claim it is, it is a different time. It is a different culture. And they viewed marriage differently than we in America do. We, unfortunately, don't see the sanctity as we once did, as we should. You know, what we see in this passage was a very compassionate thing to do. The man didn't have to pay the ultimate price because of this act of giving in to his emotions, giving in to his feelings for this woman. He didn't leave this woman with little hope for ever marrying someone else without ever having the hope of bearing children or having her own household. Instead, it now enforces that you have stolen something from her that cannot be back. Yes, it was consensual, but because of that, there is a price. There is an understanding of the sanctity in which you've taken And so this law was set to enforce the sanctity of marriage and protect the women of Israel, not to demean the women of Israel. They were meant to protect them. Yes, to punish the man who violated her, but to protect that woman from future exploitation. In fact, many of the laws in the Old Testament regarding the treatment of women had to do with protection of women in a society in which they did not have as many rights or opportunities as men. The Old Testament laws that seem to suggest a lesser status for women are actually legal provisions in a society in which women were treated as lesser. Not because God told them to, but because, again, mankind distorted the very order that God created for man and woman. It was not that God sees men and women as unequal in value, but it was humans who chose to mistreat one another. And so these laws came as a way to protect these women living living in such a time and in such a culture. So these laws protected. It showed compassion for these women, for these young girls. So they, again, that hopefully throws out that accusation. Well, another common accusation used is why does scripture use terms such as master you know sarah refers to abraham as master when referring to her husband one should never call her husband a master and then those verses we just read talk about a bride price well that just that isn't right but again let's look at it a little deeper the term master or lord was a sign of respect and honor set out of love not out of subservience but again in our modern feminist mindset you know we have to to prove that i'm just as equal i would never submit in any such a way we're showing that we can't love as god has called us to love and i don't expect my husband to love in the way that he's called to love and so master or lord was a sign of respect it was not subservience the bride price was a payment made by a man to that family as a gift, as a sign that I love your daughter. I love this woman. I want to be her husband. And so the bride price showed a commitment. 
and a devotion. It was an assurance of the man's commitment to that union. It's not unlike many of our modern day respectful practices. I went to my now father-in-law, asked for his daughter's hand in marriage. And what did he ask in return? Is that I protect, I take care of, I support his daughter. And I did that out of honor and respect for him and out of my love for Allison. So I did it to show that I am committed, I am devoted, and I want you to be assured of the life that I want to have with her. That's what the bride price was in Israel. But again, in our modern minds, we say, these women are not up for sale. Well, that's not what a bride price was anyway. But then, of course, they turn to the New Testament and have issue with Paul's words in Ephesians, Ephesians 5. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Oh, man, I've heard a lot of critics on this. Our modern ears, they hate that word submit, right? No, I won't submit to anyone, let alone my man. But they take that one word and arrogantly say, I do not submit. And the reason they say they won't submit is because they haven't first submitted to God. They leave off the requirement of what the man is expected to do because they don't like that word and therefore fail to understand what that word actually means. Because the requirement for men is just as heavy, if not heavier. It says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands should love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. So it says, wives submit out of love, out of respect. But husbands, love in a love that you can't describe, a love that is exemplified but can never be elevated to. But love as hard as you can. Love in that sacrificial love. Love in a way that understands your responsibilities and your requirements. It says, I'm willing to give up my very life because I love you more than I love my own life. At the bare minimum, it says, as your own bodies. Treat your wife with that kind of love and respect. And so biblical marriage is, is a love of complete surrender of oneself. It is far from misogynistic if it is biblical. It's a love that would submit to, respect, honor, and yes, lay down your life for that one you love that you call husband or wife. Men, we're called to a level of love for our spouses in which we can't fathom if it's without Christ. Jesus set the bar of submissive love, surrendering his life in our place. And then he's calling husbands to follow that example. So men who use verse 22 to justify mistreatment of subservience or you know, misquote it to live out a justified misogynistic mindset completely misunderstand the male husband responsibility in marriage. So it is far from the approval of misogyny and is, in fact, the exact opposite. It is a true biblical Christ-like love that says, Submittance is my way of showing my love. It is a sign of respect. I submit not because I'm a servant, but because I want to serve in a way that shows my love because my husband loves me greater than he loves himself as Christ has loved the church. A tremendous amount of love. And so, again, it debunks those claims. Another one, some have issue with verses like 20, 17 and Exodus. Claim unflatteringly, inappropriately views wives as property. It says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Well, accusers here say, well, this command it sets the wife in the same category as the house, as the livestock. But one big problem with this claim is that just a few verses earlier in 2012, we see that children are commanded to give their mother honor equal to that of their dead. In fact, mom is listed first in that command. So even in the Old Testament, even in Israel, mom had equal authority over her children. A very striking contrast to other laws of that day, like the law of Hammurabi. In the ancient Near East, 
the norm was actually the mom has a son and now she is subservient to her own son. That's not what we find in Israel. Instead, Exodus commands equal reverence for mom and dad. It does not equate wives with livestock or houses. They are not a commodity in Israel as they are not a commodity today. In a biblical understanding of marriage and love, we realize that is a far-fetched mentality when taking the whole of Scripture. And again, just look at the long list of notable women in Scripture that were praised for their strength, their tenacity, their leadership, their compassion, and know that the Bible does not demean women, but it highlights their gifts. Yes, Scripture references the worst within humanity, but by highlighting sin, Scripture accentuates the need for a Savior. Already in the Old Testament, God was establishing laws to protect against the worst of mankind. And so misogyny and sexism are completely opposed to the teaching in the Bible. In many ways, the Bible countered those misogynistic treatments of women in ancient times. And it's giving us a different and radical worldview all throughout human history and throughout the world today. So those criticizing the Bible for a misogynistic attitude towards women or a sexist teaching should consider the status of women in pagan cultures at that time and today even compared to those Christian nations or predominantly Christian nations throughout history and today. Because the Bible advocates for equal value and worth for all. It doesn't advocate sameness, but it equals value and worth. Men and women were given different complementary roles in the family and the church. But the fact that different people had different roles or different gifts is not a sign of inequality. It is a display of God's wisdom and creative power of God's ordained order. So the Bible ascribing different roles to men and women does not constitute sexism. Our differences do not mean a lack of fairness, but an understanding of the need for both roles in the church and in the family. And so the Bible makes it abundantly clear that God expects men to take that spiritual leadership role in the church and at home. Does that make women in fear? Absolutely not. Does it mean women are less significant, less capable, or viewed of less as less in God's eyes? Absolutely not. What it means that in our sin-stained world, there has to be structure and authority. God has instituted the roles of authority for our good, for his glory. So any sexism, any misogyny are the result of an abuse of those God-given roles out of pride, out of selfishness, out of a misunderstanding of God's order and God's design, both within the church and within the home. So, in short, no, the Bible is not misogynistic. God is not misogynistic. It shows us what sacrificial love truly looks like. Let's pray.